Okay, you can hear. Okay, so here, okay, when you have a pressure which is going to be low, okay, low pressure, what happens is the molecules itself, they are not going to be pushed closer to each other. So they are going to be kind of further away from each other. So this will actually help to, uh, to make uh, sure that there is no intermolecular forces of attraction. So we say that if they are closer, uh, then the intermolecular forces of attraction will be there. So if you have less pressure, then they're going to be further away. So less intermolecular forces of attraction. Okay, other way that you can actually ensure that the, they follow the ideal gas is by increasing the temperature. Now, if you increase the temperature, okay, the particles or the molecules, they will gain enough energy, okay, the heat energy will be changed into kinetic energy. They start to move around and they will start to go further away from each other, okay, that will also help Okay, to increase the distance from each other. That will also help to make sure okay, that they do not have any intermolecular forces with each other. Okay, so in order to ensure ideal gas, okay, we need to make sure that the Sir. pressure is low. Yes? The meeting is locked. And boy, you are... even cannot join. Okay. So he can join now. Okay, so here, okay, we have um, a situation where um, when you have pressure which is low and then if you have temperature that is going to be high, we can say the real gas can actually behave more ideally. It can behave more ideally. So that is going to be what we want, okay? Why we want to make sure that the gas behave ideally? because we want them to follow this formula okay the formula is going to be pv equals to nrt so pv equals to nrt okay is what we call as ideal gas formula okay or ideal gas equation and this ideal gas equation we get it based on a few experiments okay done by few scientists okay they have done some experiments and we combine all of those data all those findings and we came about with this formula which is pressure is going to be measured in pascal volume is going to be measured in meter cube n is going to be number of moles okay so number of moles is uh, mass in gram divided by uh, mr so R is going to be a gas constant. So this gas constant is always going to be 8.31. And then T will be the temperature, will be always Kelvin. So if you have any form of degree Celsius, you need to add 273. You need to change it into Kelvin. Yeah. So now, okay, uh, let's look at the graphs, okay, the, the relationship and how did they actually came up with this formula at the first place and so on. Now, there are three main, uh, three main findings, okay, that they found out, okay, related uh, when they want to actually come with this formula. Okay, this one, okay, they found out that pressure, okay, is directly proportional to temperature, okay. So the this equation or this was, uh, I think there is a law. So this one, they call it pressure law. And then there is also a finding, okay, where volume is directly proportional to temperature. So just to actually uh, look at it, you see a pressure is directly proportional to temperature means uh, when you increase the temperature, generally pressure increases. Okay, that is actually what they say. Why pressure increases? You see, when you have a particular molecule, they start to gain enough kinetic energy. They start to hit the wall of the container. If they hit the wall of the container, it means pressure is going to be more. Okay, so that is going to be kind of why we have the pressure law. Okay, common sense, yeah? Okay, but they have a, in a, a sense of a relationship. Okay, when you see volume with temperature, okay, this law was actually discovered by Charles Law. Okay, it's not important. I'm just telling you because it's actually related to your physics. 
volume is directly proportional to temperature. It means that generally when you increase the temperature, we expect the volume okay, to become bigger. Okay? So uh, if you heat up something, okay, the gas will start to expand. So of course, the volume will become more. Okay? So it's also common sense also, but they have, uh, there is a relationship, okay, directly proportional. Now, this relationship was discovered by Boyle. Okay? So Boyle's law. So they say that the pressure is inversely proportional to V. So it means that when the pressure increase, volume becomes smaller. So I think it's understood. If you have more pressure, so of course the volume becomes smaller. Okay, so they actually found out all this relationship and what they have done, they combined those relationships to become this formula. Okay, how did they combine? I think it started like this. P is directly... Um, Okay, if you put like P directly proportional with uh, T and then P is also inversely proportional to V. So they put like this, okay. And then they found out that if you draw a graph, okay, they found out it's a straight line graph. So whatever it is, okay, they found out, okay, if I bring this here, I have PV directly proportional to T. If you want to change this equation into... Uh, K, so it will be like this. K is a constant. So they found out the constant, okay, is actually either N and R. And do remember, N is number of moles. It's not actually a constant, okay. If you have the same sample, then it's constant. But different sample, different mass is going to be different. So they've calculated the value of R. But whatever it is, okay, let's actually forget about this first, okay. So what they have done, okay, they have actually put this in form of graph, okay. So if you have, okay, if you follow the things that I actually mentioned to you just now, okay, they have actually like, for example, V directly proportional to T. So if I have graph, okay, that graph will look like this. It's a straight line graph. Okay, it's a straight line graph. So if I have like, for example, P directly proportional to T, then the graph will be also a straight line graph. How about P directly proportional to 1 over V? So let's say P and 1 over V I put over there. So it's going to be a straight line graph also, 1 over V. But since I say it's inversely proportional to V, so if I have P and V, so Christopher, what do you think the graph if let's say, let's say you have y equals to 1 over x, how 1 over x will look like, the graph? Uh, it's going to be like a straight line but with a negative. No, it should be like this, uh, It's right? going down. Yeah? Uh, what graph is this? I think, is it called reciprocal graph, I think? I forgot, okay, what is the yeah. name? Yeah, so it's actually 1 over x, okay? 1 over x will be something like this, yeah? So this is going to be the graph to show that, okay, the Boyle's law, they actually found out P is, uh, is uh, inversely proportional to V, yeah, inversely proportional to V. Now, I can also draw these graphs, okay, if let's say P comes over here, T come over here, if I change P come over here, T comes over there, it's still going to be the same, nothing will change. So it's still going to be a straight line graph. If you have V and T here, T and V is still going to be the same. I want you to understand this. But what we need to take note over here is when you put all these kind of relationship together, you need to take note that if you use P and T, then one of it must be constant. What is constant? V is constant. Okay, you cannot change the V. Then only you do this relationship. So if you have V and T, so one of it must be constant, so P is constant. You make sure you do that experiment at that particular pressure, then you get this kind of relationship. If you have this P and V, then this one, the temperature must be constant. Now, after they actually get this, okay, they can also, okay, you can also change to some other graphs. Okay, things might get like a bit confusing now. But 
whatever confusing or whatever things that we are drawing, okay, I want you to remember this. This one, P directly proportional to T. V directly proportional. Okay, guys, give me a moment, yeah. I got disconnected. Christopher, can you hear me? Yeah. I think my connection is not that strong. I will try to share the screen. Okay, I think uh, you should be able to see my screen now. Frederick, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, what I wanted to say just now is when you have okay, P and T, the relationship is like that. V and T, the relationship is like this. When it comes to P and V, the relationship is like this. Okay. So if they give you any kind of graph, they ask you to uh, predict what will be the graph Okay, how it, it will look like and so on. Okay, please take note of that. Okay, like for example, P is directly proportional to T. So if they give you P with 1 over T, okay, what will be uh, the graph that you expect, Nicholas? Straight line. No. The graph that you will get straight line is going to be for P and T. So if they put 1 over Okay, one over something, then the line, uh, the graph that you will get is going to be a reciprocal graph. Okay, take note of this. So I'm just actually uh, guiding you if there are going to be this kind of situation, this thing might, uh, you need to know. It's not in your, in your, any part in your textbook, okay, but questions they can ask you about this, okay. So if you have direct pro uh, relationship P and T, if the graph is one of it is one over something, okay, the graph will look like this. Okay, so you see here, P, T is a straight line here. So similar to that, if I have okay, direct proportional volume and T, so if I have one over T, so Frederick, what do you think the graph will look like? The same as the first one. Yes, okay, it's going to be like this. The same as well when it comes to 1 over T with V. Okay, take note of this, okay? Now, if I go to this example, I know that, okay, P and V, yeah? P and V, if I draw, then it's going to be reciprocal graph, okay? So, reciprocal graph, okay, hold on. But if I draw P with 1 over V, then it's a straight line, okay? Let's actually draw the other way around then. If you have V and P, okay, P and V, V and P is still going to be the same. The graph will be like this. Okay, please understand this concept. If you have 1 over V with P, so it's going to be the relationship P and 1 over V is direct relationship. So this will be a straight line graph. Hope you can understand this. Yeah. So it's actually uh, all this graph that I draw is going to be some kind of a, I took it from the main graph. The main graph is going to be this one. Okay. Of course, these are the main graphs. Okay. And it's more like physics now. Okay. But again, I'm actually teaching you because there are questions okay there are questions 
uh, of course, you do not need to know about pressure law, Charles law, and so on, but the relationship between them, you need to know. Yeah. So how, if they give you different kind of graphs, you need to know about those graphs. Now, how about combined equations? Okay. So we know when you actually have all those relationships together, you have PV equals to NRP. Now, if you have the same number of mass, okay, same number of mass, so this part can become constant. Okay, it means R and N, okay, PV equals to NRP. So R is a gas constant. If the same mass, the N is constant. If this one is constant, okay, if I combine them, what will happen? So just imagine, you know, straight line graph is Y equals to MX plus C, your mass, okay? If I have PV equals to RN, okay, just now I said this one is constant, and then you have T, and then plus zero. If I com uh, compare this with a straight line graph, this is going to be your y-axis. This one is going to be your x-axis. This is going to be your y-intercept. So if I represent this in this kind of way, PV comes over here and T comes over here. It is very important that you know that the graph will look like this, passing through zero straight line, because I just mentioned to you, they will follow a straight line graph. Okay, this is another graph that you need to know. Okay, you can get this uh, graph based on this equation. Okay, so if let's say they give you some gradient and you can find the gradient, actually you can calculate the N number of moles if you know the gradient. Why? Because we know that the gradient is R times N. And if you know the R, I think uh, you should know what is the R, 8.31. You can always calculate N if you know the gradient. Okay, you can always calculate. So this one you need to know, yeah. Now, I have actually also put this in form of different kind of graphs. If you have PV, okay, do remember, I'll put PV equals to NRT. PV equals to NRT. If it is against T, then it's a straight line. But what happens if I have PV against V? PV against P. Now, if you follow the straight line graph, okay, Y equals to MX plus T uh, plus C, the X axis is going to be the T. Now, if you have Y axis as PV, and then suddenly you increase the P or you increase the V. Do you have any effect to the graph, Josh? My question is, if you have PV equals to NRT, and this is going to be your Y axis now, okay? And if it is X axis is T, then it's a straight line, okay? But now, if I have this as Y axis, and then your X axis is going to be V, do you think when V increases, PV is going to change? It will increase. No, it will not increase, yeah? So you can see that, okay, according to the equation also, PV equals to NRT is not dependent on V. The V is not even there in the formula for this part. So whatever V that you have over there is not going to matter. Okay, because that is going to be your Y. The Y value will be the same. That's the reason why it's going to be constant just like this. It's a straight line. The same applies, okay, when you have PV against P. You can see there is no P over here. So P is not going to matter. So it's going to be also a straight line unless you have t and then it's going to be a straight line here okay it's a straight line but this one is a constant line okay a straight line with one particular y value okay so let's actually think uh, or see how far you understand about the things that i'm teaching you okay pv equals to nrt and if you have this kind of situation what do you think the graph will be Ryan? 
Um, I, I don't know, sir. Yeah, the way to do this, okay, let's actually try to relate it to y equals to mx plus c, okay? So pv and t, okay, t is here. So bring the t over there. So pv over t equals to nr. Okay, pv over t is equals to nr. And what I can see over here is going to be, if you use the y equals to mx plus c, if I change this into rn, this is a constant, okay, which is, this is also a constant. n is going to be your x-axis, which is this one. This is the x-axis. There is no C that's going to be zero. So I can represent this using a straight line graph. It means that if the N is increasing, the PV uh, over T will also increase because they will follow Y equals to MX plus C. This is a straight line graph. Now, my question now is how about the gradient? Frederick, what do you think the gradient will be? 8.31. Very good. Okay, the gradient is R, which is 8.31. If you calculate the gradient of this particular graph, you can actually get the gas constant. That is how scientists actually calculated or found out the gas constant. Okay, this is how they actually calculated and found the gas constant is 8.31, the thing that we memorized. Okay, so if you look over there, there's so many graphs that I have discussed over here. Okay, but in summary, what is important? I think the thing that is important is you need to know that okay, the relationship, the main relationship is okay, pressure is inversely proportional with V. Second relationship, pressure is directly proportional with T, volume directly proportional with T. Using these three combinations, we came up with this PV equals to NRT. Okay, and then using this formula, you should be able to uh, predict what kind of graph it will be. Okay, like for example, if I have PV, okay, I'll just put PV equals to NRT. If I have PV with P, so PV equals to NRT, and I know this is Y axis, there's no P over here. So it means the graph should be a straight line here, okay, a constant line, okay, a straight line at Y, okay. So that is going to be for ideal gas, okay, for ideal gas. But now, let's actually look at the real situation. Now, I have three graphs over here. Okay, three graphs over here. Uh, I have labeled them A, B, and C. Okay, to show that if it is going to be ideal, they're supposed to follow this line. Okay, but now they are not following that same line. Okay, they are not following the same line. And if you have like, for example, three molecules over here, ammonia, methane, and H2. Okay, I want to actually find out, okay, Let's say polarity first. Okay, Frederick, can you tell whether ammonia is polar or non-polar? Polar. Okay, polar. CH4, Ryan? Uh, non-polar. Okay, non-polar. Okay, H2, Giuliano? Non-polar. Okay, now... If you have this kind of situation, so if polar molecule, they have uh, PDD, but this one is ammonia, so they will have hydrogen bonding plus VDW. So hydrogen bonding is really, really strong. Okay, so take note. Non-polar, you only have Van der Waals forces, Van der Waals forces, okay? Now, between CH4 and H2, okay, which one do you think will be a stronger Van der Waals forces, even? CH4. Okay, why? Because you see C is 6 and 12, H is 1 and 1. So I think you can look at the mass, you can also look at the electron. I think since you know the electron, it's much more easier to look at the electron. 6 electron, 
four electron total ten electron each one one okay so one electron plus another one electron okay h2 so two so less electron less van der waal forces more electron more van der waal forces okay so less van der waal forces now i want to know which one can behave ideally the most ideal megan Which one is most ideal? Ideal gas means no intermolecular forces, negligible volume. So which one do you think is going to be most ideal here? H2. Yes, this is most ideal. Which one is the least ideal? Benedict? CH4. No. Okay. the wall forces compared to hydrogen bonding, which one is stronger? Hydrogen bonding. Yeah, so this one is going to be the least. Okay, this one is going to be the least ideal or more towards real gas. Okay, because they have intermolecular forces of attraction. Now, using this uh, ammonia, um, CH4 and H2. Okay, I want you to actually look at this graph. Which one do you think will represent A, B, and C? Do you know what's the meaning of deviate? Nicholas Chai? I don't know. Deviate means, okay, deviate means not the same or they are different, okay, or they are going against, okay, they are going against. Uh, they are not equivalent, okay, so deviate means they are going different way, kind of that. So if you look over here, it's supposed to be ideal gas. They're supposed to follow this line. But there are three different graphs over here. There is one graph that deviates a lot from the ideal gas. Can you tell me which graph that deviates more from the ideal gas? So you have A, B, C. Which one will be the one that deviates more? The other dot school is the bread side. Hmm. Go. Okay, Arvin, can you tell me which one actually deviates more? Is it B? Couldn't hear you. Is it B? Yeah. B is the one that actually deviates more. They don't follow. Okay, they don't follow. And then can you tell me which one somehow closely following the ideal guess? Frederick? Compared to A, B, C, which one closely following ideal gas? A. Yeah, A. They deviate less. Okay, they deviate less. Now, something that closely follows the ideal gas, can you tell me if I want to label A, what A might be? Something that is closer to ideal gas. Which one will be closer to ideal gas? Megan? H2. Yeah, H2 is going to be closer to the ideal gas and the one that is going to be way deviating from the ideal gas behavior is NH3 and this one will be the CH4. I want you to actually understand this concept. Okay, deviating. Okay, deviating and using this graph. This graph came out okay, in one of the passe paper as well. Okay, so I'm showing you. But again, that graph is not limited to that. You can have any of these graphs. 